ditching is a precautionary or a forced landing of a land plane in water. Now, the mere mention of such an emergency usually makes us think about small airplanes crossing large oceans or of pilots who intentionally fly beyond gliding distance of land while crossing channels, lakes, or bays. Sure, these pilots need to know about ditching, but they're not the only ones. Of the 30 to 40 general aviation ditchings that occur in U.S. coastal or inland waters each year, Many are performed by pilots who ordinarily do not venture over water. Look, sometimes flying over water is unavoidable, such as when operating IFR between coastal airports. Arrival and departure routes frequently require pilots to fly beyond gliding distance of land for uncomfortably long periods of time. Oh, that's really cute. Thank you very, very much. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll see you later. Oh, sorry. Uh, and there are times when pilots choose to land in the water because this appears to be safer than landing on a beach. For example, a few years ago, a flight instructor and his student landed a Piper Arrow right out there after their engine had failed. Now, the beach, well, it was crowded with sunbathers and the nearby highway choked with traffic. They had no choice but to ditch. Actor Larry Hagman, by the way, was one of the onlookers who helped to tug the aircraft out of the water and onto the sand. And then there was the pilot of a Cessna Skylane who was crossing the Rocky Mountains on a VFR flight plan. Now, you wouldn't think that he'd be concerned about ditching, but that's exactly what he did shortly after his engine failed. Now, instead of trying to find a soft spot in the granite, the pilot ditched in this mountain lake. He and his family survived without injury. Well, little fella, bet you've never been flying this high before. <laughs> Welcome aboard. The most common cause of ditching is engine failure. Now, the first thing that most pilots would do at such a time is to establish a normal glide. But unless attempting to reach land, there's no reason to maximize glide range. After all, the water ahead is usually no different than the water below. So instead, descend at the minimum sink speed. Now, that's usually about halfway between the normal glide and the stall speed, the flaps up stall speed. Now, this has the effect of reducing sink rate, which increases the gliding time required to lose altitude. And this gives you more time to plan for the ditch. Now, when you get down to about, oh, 1,000 feet or so above the water, lower the nose a tad and resume the normal glide speed for any last minute maneuvering that, that might be required. One exception to this is when a maximum range glide is needed to reach a distant boat or ship which can offer the best assurance of assistance if a ditching cannot be made close to shore. Now, it is best to try to ditch ahead of the ship to ensure that someone on board will see you. Also, ditch to one side of the vessel and not directly in front of it. A large ship might not be sufficiently maneuverable to avoid a collision. Now, while still at altitude, attempt to communicate with any ground facility or even another aircraft to initiate a rescue operation. Also, activate the ELT, if possible, and squawk the emergency code on your transponder, even if you think you're too far from land. In some cases, long-range radar can extend 1,000 miles out to sea. Before ditching, try to find the time necessary to brief your passengers about the use of emergency exits and do not attempt to evacuate until after the aircraft comes to rest. Now, if available, life jackets should be put on as soon as possible, but they shouldn't be inflated until outside the aircraft. Now, this is because an inflated jacket makes it much more difficult to escape from tight quarters and is more likely to be punctured during escape from the aircraft. Okay, anyone who has seen a late night rerun of the High and the Mighty knows what to do. Loose objects that could become flying missiles during a crash landing are either stowed or thrown overboard. Also, collars and ties should be loosened and eyeglasses removed. Oh yeah, and be sure to take off your shoes. It makes swimming just a little bit easier. When about one minute from touchdown, each passenger should be instructed to assume the crash position. He should grab and hold onto the glare shield or the seat immediately in front of him. 
and rest his forehead on his arms. And the pilot should remove headset to prevent from becoming entangled in wire during evacuation. One final preparatory item is the subject of some controversy. Now, many argue that the cabin door should be kept closed during ditching to keep the cabin as watertight as possible. Eh, sounds logical, doesn't it? Well, the problem is that structural distortion might occur during the ditching, and this might jam the door and prevent those inside from getting out. That's why others recommend that the door should be opened when on final approach and kept open by jamming a shoe or something like that between the door and the frame. Another controversy involves the seaworthiness of high wing versus low wing aircraft. Now, most pilots believe that the ideal airplane for ditching is a low wing airplane with the landing gear retracted. But the statistics don't substantiate this. Believe it or not, wing position and landing gear configuration do not appear to have any effect whatsoever on survivability. Low wing airplanes do offer superior planing and buoyancy, especially with empty tanks. But don't land with the flaps fully extended because this can cause the nose to pitch down and make the airplane behave like a submarine. As a result of ditching with flaps up, low wing airplanes do land faster and that increases the chances for damage or injury. Now look at this. When ditching a low wing airplane, it's much easier to dig a wing tip into a rolling sea during touchdown, which can result in a cartwheel. Since the flaps of high wing airplanes are usually well above the water during the initial part of the ditching, they should be used to reduce touchdown speed. Also, the ailerons of high wing airplanes are also kept high and dry and this helps the pilot to maintain lateral control and keep the wingtips out of the water during the ditching. The Coast Guard recommends ditching with the gear retracted when possible, but this doesn't mean that retractable gear aircraft are better for ditching than fixed gear aircraft. As a matter of fact, just the opposite seems to be true. Of the 104 ditchings made in U.S. coastal waters during a recent three-year period, half were made in retractables, yet these accounted for two-thirds of the fatalities that occurred during splashdown. Now, this is probably because retractables usually have higher stall speeds than fixed gear aircraft. As a result, retractables usually touch down at higher speed and are subject to greater deceleration forces. Now, look. I told you to stay out of the way. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, but if you have a choice, you obviously should ditch with the gear retracted. But when touching down with a smooth belly, the aircraft tends to skip just the way a flat spinning rock does when tossed toward a deep puddle at an acute angle. Now this initial touchdown is quite mild, but hang on. The second impact is likely to be much more severe. As airspeed decays, the elevator loses effectiveness, and the nose may begin to dig in. On the other hand, those who have ditched slow aircraft with fixed landing gear say that the gear digging in during initial impact prevents the aircraft from skipping and striking the water in a nose-down attitude. The aircraft simply decelerates rapidly with the nose burrowing only slightly. Now, this might be safer than risking the secondary nose-low impact often associated with retractables. Now, considering all of the arguments, experts have yet to decide which is the best aircraft for ditching, except that it should have stall characteristics, be built of wood, <laughs> and be stuffed with ping-pong balls. Although the touchdown speed when ditching should be as low as possible, don't make a full stall landing because the nose might drop and be the first to strike the water. Instead, fixed gear aircraft should touch down in about a 10 to 12 degree nose high attitude. Retractables, well, they should be landed in about a five to eight degree nose high attitude. Now these target attitudes are critical because if the aircraft touches down with a nose too high, the tail might strike first 
and force the nose down too rapidly. On the other hand, if the attitude is too flat, the nose may dig in prematurely. When ditching in a lake, simply land into the wind. And if you have to ditch in a river, land with the current to reduce impact speed, unless a, unless a really strong wind suggests otherwise. But when ditching in an ocean, it can be much more difficult to determine which way to land. The surface of an ocean is almost always characterized by long parallel swells. And according to the Coast Guard, you should land parallel to the swells unless the surface wind is really strong. Landing in the face of a swell can be like flying into the side of a mountain. Unfortunately, it is very difficult to detect swell movement when below 2,000 feet. Now, right now, for example, we're at 1,000 feet. Uh, can you see the swells? <laughs> Boy, I sure can. The state of the sea must be determined when at a higher altitude. But even this is not very easy unless the swells are pronounced. Now, right now, we're at 4,000 feet, and I still can't pick out the direction of the swells. Can you? Learning to recognize swell movement is one aspect of ditching that you can practice during routine flights along the coast. You ought to try it once in a while. After contacting the water, apply maximum nose-up elevator, <laughs> assuming that the elevator is still attached, to keep the nose out of the water. And do your very best to keep the wings parallel to the water. Don't compensate for a crosswind, because lowering a wingtip might cause it to dig in and cause a, a total loss of control. Now, the aircraft will probably come to rest in a nose-down attitude. Now, that's because its center of gravity is usually ahead of its center of buoyancy. Now, once it does come to rest, evacuate, get out, right now, even if the aircraft appears to be floating well. The typical general aviation airplane will flood and submerge in just about one minute. Ditching is a complex subject that has had experts debating for years. A pilot, however, has only one shot at doing it right, with lives hanging in the balance. Preparedness is his key to survival.